Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Adam RPG with me, Bring It On. Off camera, I did hunt down more Chitin Plate in the Mountain Pass of Woes. Uh, just enough for Gavrilov to make the helmet for me. It only took one random encounter. I also fought a couple packs of wolves, which led to Alexander. Whoops, leveling up. So we'll take care of that first thing. All right, and then we have a package for Sasha Stancevich. Uh, the fat man with a mad gaze that moves frantically from side to side. It's so surprised when you approach him that he almost jumps up. Ah, look at that. My future partner at the King's Court is back. Uh, what was it that you wanted me to do? Some memory you have. I wanted you to deliver my parcel to me. The same parcel that I lost in the forest near the old castle. You mean this parcel? Here it is. There you go. The man loudly pats you on the shoulder and shows a bundle of bills into your hand. Dude, you saved my life. Take the money. Wow, this is amazing. It's all there, tightly wrapped. The eccentric fat man becomes abruptly silent mid-sentence, freezes like a statue, and seemingly stops breathing. Where did you find it? What seems to be the problem? What's wrong? Isn't this yours? The package is mine. The stamp on it isn't. The fat man is shoving the delivered parcel in your face with unprecedented aggression. You notice a mysterious symbol scribbled in the corner. It's a pioneer horn plugged by a cork. What is the most horrifying thing you can you could ever imagine? The nuclear apocalypse? The Japanese ninjas? The Order of Assassins? Or maybe a Freddy? Kruger or even Mercury? <laughs> so let me tell you, people behind this seal are worse than it, everyone I just mentioned combined. They are a secret cartel. Slave traders, drug and arms dealers who not only don't tolerate their competitors, they physically eliminate them, like religious fanatics. And this seal means that they know. It means that there is a target on my back. Dear God. So what's inside that package of yours, huh, mailman? The fat guy skeptically stares at you. Have you not figured it out yet? I'm a black lotus dealer. It's a drug. That's what's inside the package. Get it? They've let me know that I'm in their way. Oh God, what am I going to do? Why don't you just go work for them? Then you'll stop being their competition. With people like them, there are never any job openings. I'm a dead man. See you. Thank you for everything. Well, suit yourself. Good luck. Oh, detected with this. I'm out of here. If they want to kill me, they'll have to catch me first. The man jumps up from the table and starts running to the exit from the caravan sarai, followed by the perplexed glances of the guests along the way. What a story. What a story indeed. I thought he was going to blow up before he left. I wonder if we run across him in a random encounter later. I'm not going to worry about it. His fate is sealed. The driver looks away from his car and gives you a short nod, making it clear that he had noticed your appearance. So what is it, boss? Thinking of leaving already? I'll admit, it had crossed my mind. Can you give me a ride? Sure thing. I even give you a discount for the way back. I'll give you a lift for an even grand. Just don't try to bargain with me. I'm already giving you a great deal. Best value for money. All right, let's go. I think I've done everything I came here to do. The driver turns the ignition key and inserts the greatest hits of the 70s tape in the recorder, belching out stink and exhaust gas as the truck starts moving. Let's go. So we'll swing by Red Fighter real fast, get the helmet for the chitin armor, and someone had mentioned I should ask Gavrilov how he likes it Red Fighter. I thought I did that already, but just in case I didn't, I will ask him again. Then we'll head back to Krasno and we will set sail for the Dead City. Though I do think I'm going to stop by and get that water of forgetting, whatever it's called, and reset Alexander's perk points. Though I am still on the fence about it.
Really, if I can just get him the shield... Is it shield master perk? What's it called where he gets rid of the penalties for his shield? Whoops. Of course, I opened it up on a... On Zobar's... Shield master, yeah. So if I can at least get him shield master so he doesn't have that strength penalty. And also think like the enemy would be really good on him as well. So let's see, he has what? One, two, three. Perks he doesn't need. I think he has Swindler. Let me just look at his skill tree real fast. Yeah, so he does have Swindler. So one, two, three. So you get Shield Bearer, Shield Master, and Think Like the Enemy. Yeah, those are all really good perks for him to have. These are not so much. And it'll give me a chance or an opportunity to show off the uh, the water since I haven't used it this playthrough yet. I'm not going to make this run back back across this random encounter. It's too far to bring loot back and sell it. Gavrilov, where you at, buddy? Does he sleep? If he does, where does he do it at? Because I don't think he has a home for himself. Oh, there he is. Yeah, he does have his own house. A man Gavrilov ma makes with the puppy dog eyes. He carefully combs his beard and picks a few tiny bits of lint from his armor before speaking. Gavrilov listens closely. I care to make me a chitin helmet, pal? As long as you have six chitinous plates on you. I've got the materials, and you start working right now. Gavrilov takes the tough chitin off your hands and starts piecing them together like an artist creating a mosaic. Uh, before you can decide which words to use to praise his work, he's already done. With a broad grin, the old man hands you a weird-looking helmet. Take the bizarre headpiece. Here you go. Gavrilov hopes it, hopes it is to your liking. How do you like it here in Red Fighter? Gavrilov's shoulders slump, and you're left looking into the insectoid eyes of his helmet. Okay, I have not read this yet. Gavrilov enjoys his new life. Oh, come on. I can see something's troubling you. Why so glum, chum? Gavrilov is not sad. Gavrilov just suddenly thought of a woman he met from the first caravan he saw on the surface. After being alone for so long, without a woman by his side, Gavrilov was in love from the first sight. Who was she? Some merchant lady? No, the woman said she was a stalker, whatever that means. As she told Gavrilov she was heading to some dead city. The old man abruptly grasps you by the hand and looks you straight in the eye. Please, if you ever visit this dead city and meet that lady, tell her Gavrilov says hi. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe she likes Gavrilov back. Uh, she was so pleasant with Gavrilov during our short conversation. I do as you ask, sure. But how am I going to find her? I doubt there's a ton of women living in the dead city. But still. Thank you. How best to describe her? The woman's name is Larissa. She has red hair. And also one eye and a hook for an arm. Gavrilov lost his former wife but he feels like he might have had a slim chance to find happiness before his imminent death. You said you were a widower. Can you tell me a bit more about your life? Before the war, Gavrilov was a bachelor, but after, living in Bunker 317, he learned how to use ant pheromones to keep the giant insects at bay. Luckily, 
or unluckily for Gavrilov. These pheromones also attracted the attention of mutant ant queen. <laughs> Continue listening in silence. Gavrilov started a long-lasting relationship with the ant queen, a kind of marriage one might say. One may say. After her untimely death, Gavrilov stripped all of her chitin and made a suit to always remind him of his former wife. So all this time we were having a friendly chat, not with a simple member of the proletariat, but with a degenerative, morally rotten, fetid ant king. This ant hill aristocrat, this thorax thruster. <laughs> you disgust me. Revolt against this unjust regime. Den with the tyrant. Ants of all countries unite. Gavrilov wasn't a king. Ants do not have kings. I don't want to hear your monarchical excuses. Calm down, Hexogen. When a man who lived among ants for 20 years and addresses him in the third person sounds more sane than you, doesn't that tell you something? Hexogen glares his rage at Gavrilov, who is now trembling in fear, then takes heed of your sour expression and steps away, loudly humming the Mars Marseillai? I'm not sure I want to know, but uh, I'm going to ask anyway. How did you um consummate the marriage? The old man who just opened up to you about his untraditional relationship cringes in disgust. These are complicated and traumatic memories for Gavrilov. All Gavrilov will say is that interspecies relations between man and ant at this stage of our evolution are only semi-possible. Seriously? Your armor is a reminder of your late, um, wife? Yes. Gavrilov knows how bizarre that might sound, but keep in mind that Gavrilov lived in very bizarre circumstances. Yeah, to some true love comes in summer, wearing a little green dress, while to others it comes in a dark dungeon, in the form of a giant, grotesque, egg-laying mutant insect. For reasons that are obvious, this past marriage was childless and did not bring Gavrilov any joy, only crippling mental trauma. But mayhaps now Gavrilov has a slim chance of finding true happiness. Um, yeah, okay. If I ever see this woman friend of yours, I'll tell her you said hi. Please, help Gavrilov. Gavrilov will be ever so grateful. Don't count on anything, but I promise I'll try. Alright, well we got a new helmet out of that. <laughs> a weird chitinous mess of headgear that makes the wearer look like a bug, but offers superior head protection. 4DT19DR, minus 2 dodge, and another 40% fire resist, so you can have 80% fire resist. So I guess if you wanted to, you could just equip a bunch of Molotov cocktails, get surrounded by enemies, and just keep throwing them at your feet. 4 and 19. Has better DR than my current helmet. Better DT than this helmet. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. You know what? Alexander, actually, need... Hmm. No, we're not going to give this to Alexander. I think what I'm going to do... Is give this to Fidel. We're going to give him the whole matching set of armor. He's going to take a slight hit to some of his stats. But I'd rather him have the, the whole matching set than just one piece of it. Because the, the armor isn't that much worse than the bulletproof vest anyway, so it's not... Let's see, 29, 7. So he loses 6 DR, but same DT, and he gets that fire resist, which... I do think this is just straight up worse. And that helmet isn't great looking either. <laughs> it's like he's cosplaying a dinosaur or something. But we'll rock it for now. We'll keep these on hand in case I'm not happy with that decision. And then we can always swap back if we have to. 
Either way, let's head to Krasno. I can't forget to grab diesel. I need to grab 30 diesel before we head to the dead city. One thing I wanted to check real fast, because I already forgot what the stats were. So 17 DR, 5 DT. Well, that's the wrong helmet. 15 DR, 3 DT. Yes, yeah, so four more DR and one more DT. Can't get wrong with that. You know what? No, we are gonna. We're going to put that back on Fidel. We'll optimize this build a little bit. I think I would prefer the, the matching set. Alright, let's get some diesel. I wonder if I can carry it with a backpack. Perfect. Alright, and I'm gonna go grab that water and use it on Alexander so I can reallocate his perk points. To make him more survivable, more tanky. I don't think I've seen him stun a single enemy since he's joined our party. Because he hardly ever gets any attacks off because he has such a low AP amount. And he's yet to take enough damage to actually use his adrenaline rush or surge or whatever it's called. Nice, nice long jog back to the uh, the smuggler's lair. I don't actually know what that area is called. I guess just the oh, the smuggler's lair works. Oh man, remember this room? That was a rough fight. Especially for the level we were when we took it on. Oh wait, he's not here. Is there a reason he's not here? What time is it? It's midnight. Maybe it's um... Maybe it's a time thing? Let me leave and come back and see if he's there when I get back. I don't think he was missing when Simon left. That sucks. I finally committed to uh to using the the water and the guy disappears. He's still not there. Well what the heck? He wasn't part of Simon's company. He's just a water trader. If 
fourth tier percussion revolver. Don't need that. I do have something to trade for you. Trade, though. Here we go. Speaking of recipes. Yes, I don't know where the water trader's at. I am a little disappointed. I was all excited to finally reset Alexander's perks, and now I don't get to. Well, darn. All right, let's go talk to the captain and head towards the dead city. The gray-haired captain inhales the tobacco smoke and nods to you, engrossed in his thoughts. His mind is wandering out there in the endless sea. Well, hello. You made up your mind to sail to the dead city? Oh, why not? How much will I have to pay for this pleasure? 5,000 for fuel and food. Once in the high sea, we'll set sail. We need to get out of the bay first. Well, here goes nothing. Money isn't an issue for me. Let's go. The captain licks at his fingers, or at his finger, determines in which direction the wind blows. Commands loudly to himself. Sail southwest and cast off the lines. The level rattle, the boat leaves the haven. Let's go. Don't remember this cutscene either. Also, there's no one on that boat. <laughs> it's the Flying Dutchman. I'm sorry, he said food and fuel, right? Oh, I hit the wrong key. Hope I didn't mess anything up. The captain silently puffs at his pipe. He's silently bundled up, hands in his pockets. Apparently he's not a fan of the dead city's poisonous winds. Port of the city yet? Okay, ask him if I could ask a few questions. He said, fire away. Uh, what do you know about the dead city? In Soviet times, it was a large commercial port with a population of more than 2 million. Now, what well, you can see for yourself. I do. Another question. Ask away. Uh, what can you tell me about this harbor? The stalkers built it, for me and for themselves. There's not much food to be had in this city. Not at all, frankly. So they fished further from shore. I see. Another question. Go on, speak. What can you tell me about the locals? The stalkers aren't bad people, but they aren't sweethearts either. It takes a certain attitude to live in the most dangerous place in the world, and for not very good money, too. I suppose. I have another question. Go on, speak. Do you sail further along the shore? Not in that direction. Lands further on are uninhabited, save for mutants, of course. All right. A quick save. Before I try and sail back. Aboard with the city yet? Maybe a bit. Let's sail back. Okay, the return trip is only 1500. I'm not the kind of monster that would leave a man here alone. Okay, well, we are going to leave. Already radiated. Fantastic. What was I doing? Oh yeah, I'm dropping off the diesel. Leave that right there next to the ship. And let's get talking and stalking. We'll start with this guy. A lot of ammunition and some diesel. Look at that. A stout and hardy man of middle age nods at you and opens the zipper of his weathered stalker jacket. The insides of the old jacket are lined with various wares. The man coughs a few times and introduces himself. Welcome to hell, kiddo. Misha Alteski's walking shore at your service. Or sorry, walking store. Should be walking store on the shore at your service. Are uh, you buying? I want to talk to you to ask some questions. Heh, what else can I expect apart from talk? Every other darn stalker deems himself a traitor nowadays. Why, in the olden times, I had a monopoly. 
Not now, though. Not now. Oh, how I wish I could dispose of at least one of these new merchants. Anyway, what did you want to ask me? I do like trading in these parts. Way back when I had a monopoly, it was okay-ish. Nowadays, every freak around is supposed to be a store owner, selling the crappy junk he scrapes up in the ruins. Gosh darn entrepreneurs. I'm a real professional merchant, and these punks are taking all my business. They're very lucky I'm not a bad person, because if I was, I'd start scheming against all the other traders, driving them mad or paranoid with my oh-so-intricate multi-step plans. They're lucky you're not a bad guy, then. Another question. Get to the point. Uh, what can you tell me about the dead city? It's a mousetrap with some really good cheese in it. That makes it extra dangerous. How poetic. Another question. Uh, why did you greet me with welcome to hell? You'll hear those words all over the place. It's an inside joke among stalkers. We use it to scare newbies and to remind ourselves that the dead city is always dangerous, even if you've been stalking it for three years. It's also kind of ironic, which we like. Okay then, next question. Uh, any rumors you'd like to share? A mouse, Cust, and a few other stalkers once dug into the old Pioneer Boy Scout building. After blowing up some rubble, they entered a hall with a small warehouse at the far end. They didn't find anything useful at first. Old flags, statues of Lenin, French horns, recorders, posters about the virtues of being a Boy Scout. You know, the type of crap they would have kept in storage. But then they stumbled upon a metal crate hidden beneath some coats. Believe it or not, this thing turned out to be a fridge, still working, running on some kind of uh, eternal battery. And inside, geez. A brown, foul-smelling cube labeled the Norn. Four pairs of dice made out of raw frozen meat. Thirteen tiny syringes filled with glowing liquid. A hammer made out of ice. A frozen, hollowed-out dog's head with a belt to be used like a face mask. A one to ten thousand scale model of the Kremlin, made out of white sugar. And a huge brick of tungsten, which documents or with documents that described it as a parking, parting thank you gift for someone called Vladimir Georgievich. The guys were so freaked out, they left it all right there. Even the tungsten that could have gotten them a fortune. Yeah, they could have at least grabbed the tungsten. Another question. Change subject. Right, uh, only if there's a discount. Oh no, you don't. There are so many traders around nowadays, I can barely eke out a profit as it is. If I lower my prices any further, I'll go bust. I don't think he has anything I want, so... If I end up having stuff to trade, I'll probably come to him first for the ammunition. You know what? I should leave. See ya. Alright, we'll talk to one more NPC, and then we'll probably call it an episode there. Let's start with this guy. A short man in grubby work clothes is examining you with a sly squint. When he realizes you're looking back at him, his behavior instantly changes. He smiles and waves. Welcome to hell, buddy. I'm Leoha the Chipmunk. And you are? I'm my own man, Leoka. Oh, why were you staring at me? The man waves his hand and says, somewhat shyly, It's nothing. Don't worry about it. It's not polite to talk about this kind of thing. Everything is okay. Let me be the judge of what's polite and what isn't, after you've explained everything. Fine, alright. I didn't want to mention it, since you aren't a local. The strangers don't really get our logic. I shouldn't estimate how much I could get for your clothes when I find your dead body out in the wasteland. Hey, don't get upset. I told you I told you you wouldn't understand. It doesn't mean I'm planning to rob or murder you. You could be like a son to me, but it's a fact of life that the majority of out of towners who show up here without the necessary knowledge and experience end up meeting their uh, maker very soon. Some die from radiation poisoning, some are gutted by mutants, some perish God knows why. That's why I've been trying to decide if I should watch which direction you're he headed in, wait a couple of days, and go looking for your corpse. So far my question, or sorry, my answer to that question is, yes, it makes sense. You're wearing some unusual garments. That's it. Happy now? Are we still friends? Well, thank you for your honesty. I don't plan on dying anytime soon. No one is planning on it. But believe me, you cannot escape death. Doesn't matter what you want. I could answer some more questions. The man stares down at your shoes with great interest for half a minute, then shudders and quickly answers. Sure, easy peasy. Uh, why do people call you the chipmunk? The man winks at you. Because I'm thrifty. It's not because of my cheeks, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so one more question. Well, uh, what's life like around here? I call this place hell, 
but only because of the frequent outbreaks of disease, mutant beasts, and tons of places contaminated with deadly radiation. Other than that, it's perfectly fine. Not everyone's cup of tea, but I like it. Sure you do. Alright, another question. Now uh, what are you doing here? I'm just like everyone else here, scavenging in the dead city, looting mostly wires and cable. I sell them to the mutant scrap metal collectors, for anyone who's willing to pay. Ordinary life, right? One more question. Now what's the fresh gossip in these parts? Nyoka takes a dynamo-powered bicycle light out of his pocket and places it under his chin, casting a pale, ghostly light over his features. You like stories, huh? Listen to this dark legend about General Private. On the day the bombs fell, the general of the local unit ordered a private to shine his boots. The private had started on his task when suddenly, boom, a nuclear explosion. These two men refused together. The general and the private, that became one living organism, a grotesque sort of centaur. People say that to this day, on a moonless night, if you listen carefully, you can hear this creature roaming the wastes. It shouts out profanities, threatening to send itself to the guardhouse or to expel its lazy butt from the Red Army. All of this is because of the centaur's front legs belong to the general, and they're in a hurry to get to the fight and punish the capitalist bastards, while the hind legs belong to the private, who's trying to run in the opposite direction. Home. That's one heck of a story. Another question. And that's it. Also, he mentioned shoes, or he's staring at my shoes. I realized that... So while my main character and Alexander are wearing boots, Fidel has some sort of, like, semi-formal dress shoes or something. But Hexton is running around in the wasteland in the loafers. You can see... It's hard to see right here, but I'm pretty sure... You, yeah, you can see the skin of his foot right there. He's wearing loafers as we uh, <laughs> fight mutants in the Mycelium Society. I found that absolutely hilarious. I noticed it off camera when I was hunting down those... Uh, what, bear crickets? For the chitin? Alright. But I'm going to call the episode here, and the next one we'll talk to the remaining stalkers in this area. And then we'll head into the dead city proper and uh, see what horrors await us. It's a pretty rough area. As you can see, we're already irradiated. We've only been here for a very short time. I don't think it naturally goes above 250. Until you start wandering the overworld, the map, whatever you want to call it. Either way... Wait, okay, let's swap back to this. There we go. Either way, thanks for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next one.